بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So when I last did a recording I was actually uh, traveling in Canada at that time and the recording was done uh, via mobile and, and it was uploaded uh, to uh, the Bukhari TV YouTube. Uh, but I still had plenty of questions left over. And we didn't get time to record them while I was over in Canada, but right now, inshallah ta'ala, I came back to Dubai and bi idnillahi we will record the answers to the remaining questions, inshallah ta'ala. So our first question, since Iman increases and decreases, how can we protect ourselves when our Iman decreases? So there's a general answer to this and there is a specific answer to this. The general answer to this is simply to avoid doing sins, to repent and to try to do as many good deeds as possible. That's a very vague and sort of very generic answer. But I want to give a tip that's a little bit more practical than that. So I want to talk about the certain deeds you can do that are like What's the word? Superfoods for your Iman. I think you get a lot of boost out of them for quite a small amount of, of effort. You get a big, big boost in Iman for doing them. And there are a number of different uh, sort of options for that. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that you try to find something which you know in yourself, it raises your Iman. It might be a certain lecture, a certain book that you read, a certain you know, video you've seen, and you know that every time you see it, it raises your Iman. That is something which is, you know, is, is ideal. So what are these kind of super food type, super bonuses that you can get that boost up your Iman? So from among them is to strive against yourself in something you had previously found difficult to do. So let's say, for example, you've never quite been able to get to Hajjud right. You've never quite been able to get up and go to the Masjid for Fajr. You've never quite been able to pray all your Sunnah prayers in a day. Make a real effort and strive really hard to do it. And just achieving that, you'll feel a big increase in Iman. Uh, the second thing you can do, do something for, to help your brother or to help your sister in Islam. You know, even if you can't do something for yourself, you're struggling with your prayers, you're struggling with other things, just go and help your brother and sister in any way that you can. You'll instantly feel the Iman go up. Reflecting upon the miracles of the Qur'an, definitely. The more you think about the miracles of the Qur'an, the more you think about, you know, the miracles of Allah in His creation and His signs in His creation, it's definitely a thing which massively uh, raises your Iman. And there are other things, inshallah ta'ala, that you can find that are like, you feel like you get a big, big boost out of them. Uh, and one of them, no doubt, is sincere dua at a time when your dua is accepted. And inshallah, I think there's a question on that coming up. So we'll, we'll, we'll delay that till the question, inshallah. And Allah knows best. You mentioned that a person's prayer does not count when they watch sorcery and magic. They must pray, but the reward for their prayer doesn't count. Yes, that's correct. That's what we said. We said that their prayer is not accepted for 40 days. They pray. They have to pray. If they don't pray, then they might even leave Islam. But they have to pray. But their prayer, the reward of their prayer is not accepted. It's only counted that they prayed for the purpose of them you know, remaining as a Muslim. But it's not the reward. They don't get any reward out of it. If your prayer has waswasa and doubt and distraction, are the chances of gaining reward slim to nothing? No, absolutely not. There is no comparison between those two things at all. When a person watched magic and sorcery, they've done something which would really put them on the edge of leaving the religion of Islam and bring them near to leaving the religion of Islam. So that's not at all the same as a person who suffers difficulties in their prayer. Rather, we hope that if a person who suffers difficulties tries really hard, and does their very, very best and does all the required actions in order to minimize that distraction and minimize those con that confusion, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless them in it and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them for their efforts. And perhaps a better comparison would be the comparison of the one who stutters while reading the Quran. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that the one who stutters or struggles with the recitation of the Quran gets double the reward of the one who recites the Quran fluently 
The one who recites the Quran fluently is like is along with the you know the noble and pious and righteous angels. But as for the one who stutters and struggles with the recitation of the Quran, they get their reward twice. And so you would say that that is a better comparison than comparing it to the one who went to a magician or watched a magician. Uh, it's a much better comparison to compare it to the one who struggles with the recitation of the Quran to say there's even more reward in struggling through your prayers and trying really hard than there is uh, even in praying you know, normally and fluently. For the khutbah, you mentioned Surah Al-Hujurat, uh, an ayah which the, some of the scholars mentioned that it falls under the etiquettes towards your teacher. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَ إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُمْ What is the appropriate manners towards your parents and towards your teachers? So there is no doubt that Islam is a religion that has given a great deal of importance to manners. And that is something that we have emphasized throughout our tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat that Islam gives a great emphasis and a great amount of importance towards manners and etiquettes. As for the parents, then this is a, a pretty big topic. It's actually a topic bigger than we can cover in this short video. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala summarized the rights of the parents by saying, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا And towards your parents, excel in doing good to them. Exceed their expectations in doing good to them. And so there's no doubt that towards your parents, the right and the etiquettes with your parents are immense. Uh, the, and, and they can all be summarized by this word, ihsan, you know, to excel or to exceed expectations. Uh, but in addition to that, you can talk about the right of obedience, uh, the right of, you know, the etiquettes around them in terms of putting them first, in terms of giving them precedence over others, including your other family members, uh, including your wife and your children, and the other etiquettes which Islam encourages towards the parents, it's a big topic. But the teachers, there's no doubt that Islam uh, has a huge, or puts the teacher in a huge position of responsibility. And that huge position of responsibility means that you do have certain etiquettes towards the teacher. Uh, and indeed, many of those etiquettes can be found in the books of seeking knowledge, such as the book, The Etiquettes of Seeking Knowledge by Sheikh Bakr Abu Zaid. And the other you know, explanations where people explain what your etiquette should be towards your teacher. So the etiquette towards the teacher should be one of respect. It should be one where you listen and you, you, know, you pay attention in their class, where you seek permission before going you know, onto other books and on, onto even potentially other teachers uh, and so on. You know, the way that you ask questions is very polite. Uh, and the way that you, you know, take the answers on board and so on. However, there's some additional things that we want to just note. Again, it's a big topic, but just to be sort of cautious, that just because we have an immense respect for our teachers, and indeed for our parents, doesn't mean that they are always right. It's well known that our teachers may be right in some things, and they may be wrong in other things. So it's not correct to say that because we respect our parents and we respect our teachers, that they, are that they are necessarily right in everything that they do or that everything they do is right and you can never ever go against them or never ever realize that or never ever accept they've done something wrong. Rather, it's about when you do go against them, you have to do so respectfully. And that's why Allah which just said about the parent, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا And if they strive to make you associate with me, i.e. with Allah, in partnership, that which, ha that which you have no knowledge of, do not obey them, but accompany them in this world in the best way. Meaning disobey them with the best of manners. That means they don't feel like they've been disobeyed, they don't feel hurt, aggrieved, that you've been rude or disrespectful, but you still don't follow something if you know that it is wrong. And no doubt all of your teachers will make mistakes. Uh, and so it's about respectfully, uh, you know, choosing the way that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without disrespecting, without upsetting them, and without breaking the etiquettes, which again, you can find more about the etiquettes with the teacher in the books of how to seek knowledge and how a student should be towards the teacher. And a kind of related question, um, is it possible for your parents to oppress you? Yes, there is no doubt. There is no doubt whatsoever that it is possible for your parents to oppress you. But I guess the, the connected question to that is, 
If your parents oppress you, what should your reaction be? And we go back to the ayah we just mentioned, the ayah in Surah Al-Luqman. وَإِنْ جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَنْ تُشْرِكَ بِي مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا There is nothing more oppressive than making a partner with Allah. And if your parents are forcing you to make a partner with Allah, there is nothing more oppressive than that. But still you are commanded to disobey them in the best way. To, be a, to accompany them, to be with them, to, to show them your, your righteousness and piety towards them, your kindness towards them, even though they do the greatest of oppression to you. So yes, a parent can oppress a child. And indeed, parents often oppress their children in many multitude of ways. Uh, we see parents oppress their children, for example, in not allowing them to marry or not allowing them to marry righteous people. Uh, or preventing them from what is good for them or forcing them into something which is bad for them, whether it be at work or whether it be in their education or in any other field, uh, preventing them from dedicating their time to seeking knowledge and all other kinds of things which are in reality forms of oppression. But it's how we behave towards that oppression and that we show respect and kindness and honor and dignity and that we don't make them feel like they have been, that we have rebelled against them or that we have turned away from them but we make them feel like we respectfully had to take another path and Allah knows best. How to avoid getting angry. So this is actually, uh, it has many levels to it. It has many levels to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised al-kaghimin al ghayd those people who conceal or repress their anger. And that tells you that Anger is something that can be, it can be repressed, it can be put back down. But one of the things I found the most beneficial to answer this question, and there's probably other videos in which I've answered it in more detail, is I have found that when you, or your anger goes through various different levels, and you know, when it gets to a level where you almost reach a level of insanity, you know, you reach a level where you're so angry that you don't know what you're saying or what you're doing. It's very hard to repress your anger at that time. So what one of the things I believe is very important is that you catch your anger before it reaches that level. So, you know, like anger is like a boiling pot. OK, so, you know, you start with it gets a little bit, the little bubbles and then the bubbles get a bit stronger. And then finally, you know, it pops out of the, the edge of the pot, you know. So anger is like that. So if you can control it before it rises up, so you see you're starting to get angry, take action then. Don't take action, you know, two years later when you're, you know, the, this anger has reached its peak and you're fuming and you know, like whatever it may be. For some people it might be, you know, five minutes between that and that. For some people it might be a couple of days between that and that. You know, it, these things are cumulative. They get worse over time. So what you want to do is instead of letting your anger get to that point where you can't control it, you try and take certain actions before the anger reaches that point. One of the actions that is very beneficial is uh, to say, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, to remember Allah uh, and to push away the shaitan. Uh, it is beneficial uh, to make wudu and to pray. Even if you don't pray, uh, just going to make wudu is, uh, is beneficial. It just helps to calm you down. Uh, even if we don't say that there's a specific, uh, necessarily a specific hadith in that regard, but just the general, you know, the general action of just cooling yourself down, calming yourself down, and, you know, potentially going to pray or do some other kind of ibadah, recite the Qur'an or whatever. Sometimes it can be uh, beneficial for you to get some time away, just to make some space or to get out of the room. It can be very, very beneficial. So, you know, sometimes when you feel your anger rising like that, one of the things you can do is just to, you know, just you don't have to storm out of the room and slam the door, but just to say, oh, just give me five minutes and go and do something different. Uh, these are all things that are beneficial. Some of the scholars mentioned lying down. So when you feel your anger rising like that, just go and, you know, go and lie down, inshallah, uh, or go and just take some time out, go for a walk outside, whatever it takes to just reduce it. But I think the key thing is, to take these actions before the anger becomes uncontrollable. Next question. Why does Allah say, Lord of the two Easts and the two Wests? Rabbul Mashriqaini wa Rabbul Maghribain. In fact, in other ayat, uh, it's also mentioned in the plural. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned Rabbul Mashariqi wal Maghrib. 
So we have the Lord of the two Easts and the two Wests and the Lord of all of the Easts and all of the Wests. So the scholars of Tafsir, they have different opinions regarding this, but one of the easiest to understand, even though they're all very similar opinions, one of the easiest uh, to understand is the fact that the sun has a different setting place in summer and a different setting place in winter and a different rising place in summer and a different rising place in winter. That's why it's not actually easy to judge the direction solely by the sun. So uh, I'm not sure of the, the proper uh, sort of uh, astronomical terminology for this or even geological terminology for this, but it, basically it's not easy to look at the sun and say that is due west or that is due east because the sun actually has a slight variation in where it rises between the summer and the winter and depending on where you are in the world that variation could be great or it could be relatively small but that's why it's not possible to look at the sun and easily say that that is directly west or that is directly east you can get a general bearing from the sun but you can't get a very precise one because the sun rises and, and sets in a different place in the summer to the winter there's a variation in the number of degrees and some of the scholars of Tafsir said that uh, there is the Mashriq of the summer and the Mashriq of the winter, and there is the Maghrib of the summer and the Maghrib of the winter, and that is why Allah said, Rabbul Mashriqaini wa Rabbul Maghribain. Others uh, mentioned other similar kind of uh, interpretations to do with daily variations of the sun and various other things, but all of them revolve around the fact that there are differences uh, in the rising of the sun and setting in the, of the sun in various situations. With regard to al-Mashariq wa al-Maghrib, the scholars said about this because it is in the plural, some of them said that this refers to the daily fluctuations in where the sun rises and sets. So yes, in terms of extremes, we can look at the summer and the winter where the sun rises in a particular place and, and rises in a different place. And the biggest variation is the peak of summer to the peak of winter. But actually, if you were to look on a daily basis, the sun slight, there's a slight variation every single day. So in reality, in, in, if we sort of summarize it, there are two easts and two wests. And if we look in detail, there are actually many, many easts and many, many wests. Each day has a slight variation or a slight fluctuation over a day or a certain number of days. And that is why Allah said, بِرَبِّ الْمَشَارِقِ وَالْمَغَارِبِ By the Lord of the Easts and the Wests, and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. So this is a very good question. How does the shaitan attack us and sort of come into our mind? So actually, uh, this question has uh, different answers to it. So there are different ways that a shaitan can kind of get inside of your head. Probably the most common way is just by whispering. So this is where the shaitan doesn't physically enter into you or doesn't physically possess you or take control of you, but instead whispers to you and sort of gets in your head and sort of whispers inside your mind. So that is one aspect and we call that al-wiswas or al-waswasa. Uh, the other uh, thing which is also uh, very common or also happens to people is the shaitan attacking a person and actually sort of coming inside of them and we call this possession. Uh, and this is something the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the shaitan flows through the children of Adam like the blood flows. Both of those have their various solutions to it, including Ruqya Shara'iyah and remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to push out the shaitan from you know around you. How do you advise your parents without offending them? Wallahi, that's a beautiful question, and that's a question that requires a lot of hikmah, a lot of wisdom. It's not an easy question to answer. Every situation is different, but it's very important that you behave like a diplomat. You know how a diplomat behaves? Like an ambassador. A diplomat never wants to offend the country, even though, you know, sometimes he's going to a country and maybe even the country, you know, they're at war with him or they are, they're having a big disagreement with him. But they never want to offend, you know, so they're very careful in the words, very careful in the time that you choose to speak to them about things very careful in the way that you word it. So let's look, at, let's look at a couple of different things. Let's look at when you choose to speak to them. So mom and dad are having a fight. It's not a good time to go up to them and say, you know, mom, you shouldn't be fighting with dad. 
dad, you shouldn't be fighting with mom, especially if you think that they're going to get really angry and they're going to start fighting with you or they're going to say to you, don't get involved. But maybe after it's finished, maybe going privately to one and to the other and saying to them that, look, you know, maybe inshallah ta'ala, Allah make it easy for you not to argue like that again. It's, it's not good. And giving them a hadith, giving them an ayah from the Quran or something like that. But the key thing is when you choose to speak to them. You know, you choose if you need to get involved right at the time because you think it's urgent, you have to be involved, then you have to get involved. But if you think there's a way that you can maybe delay it and have a word with them a little bit later on in private, not sort of put them down in front of other people, that's one thing. The second thing is that you need to be very careful not to show bias for one over the other. So if, if mom and dad are fighting, you don't want it to be a case that you seem like you're on your mom's side or on your dad's side. Rather, you should kind of see to be that sort of neutral person who's making islah, making peace and reconciliation uh, between them. As for how you speak to them, it must be the speech of someone who is lower to someone who is higher. The speech of someone who is uh, of, of a low status to a person who has, is of a high status. And of course, the way you talk to your friends and the way you talk to the people who are below you is not the same as the way you talk to the people above you. And your parents are above you in, in, you know, in every respect in terms of their status and their honor and respect. So you have to speak to them like that. You know, it's pretty much like advising a king, right? If you wanted to advise a king or you wanted to advise a president or someone like that, you know, you're not going to kind of raise your voice and shout with them and point out, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You're going to find very sort of wise words to say, look, you know, this is what you taught us. And I only learned from you that we have to change. We don't have to be like this and it's not the right etiquette. And... You know, subhanAllah, I just wanted to, to sort of kind of just mention that to you. And, you know, I know that, subhanAllah, you, you know, you're older than me. And you kind of put it in a very respectful, a very kind way. You don't want to put it that I'm telling you you're wrong. You don't know your religion. I learned. You didn't. Or anything. You want to be very respectful and very sort of speaking as though you're, you're, you are the one in the lower position to the one in the higher position so that they can really take that advice on board. And if you give it for the sake of Allah, Azza wa Jal, it will have an effect bearing in mind that often if there's issues going on between mom and dad it can often be because their relationship with Allah needs improving gentle suggestions come why don't we come to a class together I would love it if you would come with me can we go some, spend some time in the masjid together what do you think and you know when they say no just respecting that but trying a different way from different angles and finally if you find that you're not your advice is not welcome maybe you're one of the younger children then try looking at one of the older children to advise them or one of their brothers or sisters or perhaps uh, looking at you know, them getting advice from maybe someone who is perhaps older than them. You know, so look at who you can bring in to give advice to them and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. How can I better my relationship with Allah in terms of dua and increase my tawakkul in Allah? I think uh, tawakkul we've dealt with in the previous Q&A session but how can I better my relationship with Allah in terms of du'a? What I would recommend is I have a video um, which is uh, related to du'a and I believe it's called du'a the weapon of the believer, something like that. And inshallah you can find it on YouTube if you type in Muhammad Tim and you type in du'a, it will come up. It's also on my website muhammadtim.com uh, forward slash video or videos, I think. Uh, it's on there too. So it's a, 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 a full thing on du'a and how to improve the etiquettes and relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through du'a. It's hard for me to ignore suspicions and to have good thoughts of people. What are some of the ways to combat this bad habit? Jazakallah khairan wa um, I think good thoughts of people. I think one of the ways that you need to combat this is by realizing that Islam requires you to have good thoughts of people, whether they are guilty or not. It's not about the fact that you're wrong, and it's not about the fact that they're innocent. It's about the fact that Allah commanded you to have a certain standard of proof before you act. So we give an example of that. The example of uh, the people who came in the time of Umar ibn Khattab anhu, to testify that a person committed zina. So there were four of them as is required for witnesses. Three of them saw what was going on and one of them saw a part but didn't see everything happen in full. Three of them saw. 
Now, for you and me, you and I know if three people saw something happening and every one of them described in detail and the th fourth one saw but not quite the full picture, then we know that it's something that happened. None of us doubt that this is something that happened. None of us think that all four of them came and lied. But because it didn't reach the Islamic standard of proof, which is four witnesses that saw every single thing, Omar applied the punishment of the of false testimony against those four people. Omar applied the punishment of, of false testimony against those four people. So this is what I mean about the fact that, you know, sometimes you think, well, I've got a right to be suspicious, but you don't have a right because Allah told you you don't have a right. It doesn't matter whether you might be right or you might be wrong. Islam has certain standards. So it's not about the fact that you think it might be true or you don't think it might be true. It's about the fact that Allah commanded you to uphold a certain standard. So that's the first thing. I think it's a good habit to get into. You need to get into the habit of realizing that you can be wrong, of realizing that the right of your brother, and, and thinking of things how you would want to be treated if you were in that situation yourself. None of you really believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And wouldn't you want to be considered to be innocent by your brother or your sister in Islam? if you were the one in that position, and through practice, and learning, and studying, and learning the etiquettes, inshallah ta'ala, you can avoid uh, suspicion and bad thoughts of people, and when these thoughts come in your mind, then it is a good idea to say, a'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem, to say, subhanallah, it's not right for us to speak about this. Uh, some words like this, like, like for example, some of the words that are mentioned in Surah An-Nur, about the ifk, that was the lies that was spread about our mother Aisha radiallahu anha uh, and so on, you know these words like subhanallah and a'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem and astaghfirullah, I seek Allah's forgiveness that I should ever think something like this about my brother again, it doesn't matter whether it's true or not it doesn't matter in your situation whether it's true or not because at the end of the day you don't want to be one of those people who gets involved in something and then only to find that that thing is actually false and you misunderstood how it is and then you become regretful over hurting a people as we learned in Surah Al-Hujurat and you become regretful uh, about what you've done and you become regretful about what you've said or what you've thought about the person and Allah is our general's best so this concludes the question and answer session inshallah ta'ala I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed uh, the program that we did over in Ottawa and indeed all of the programs that we did in Canada uh, it was uh, an amazing experience. The students showed an, a fantastic attitude, uh, studied really hard and asked very, very intelligent questions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit them in the knowledge that they have gained. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit their community by them. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them to be able to continue to seek knowledge and to grant them knowledge and understanding of the religion. I would also on a personal note like to say Jazakumullah khairan uh, for all of the uh, kind words and the support and indeed you know the gifts and all of the other stuff that everybody gave. Uh, Jazakumullah khairan. Uh, it was very uh, touching to see that the students uh, had so much care and so much consideration uh, and may Allah Azawajal reward you all for that. And inshallah ta'ala it will not be the last time that I will be able to come over to, uh, to Canada and to be able to share some things with you and to be able to learn from you as well because these certainly these questions and indeed the, the work that we did throughout the course it was something that I learned a lot from uh, and I benefited from uh, immensely May Allah Azawajal reward you all and Allah Azawajal knows best Wassalatu wassalam ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in